From a Collection of Unmitigated Pedantry, the blog of History Professor Brett Devereux. The Queen's Latin, or Who Were the Romans? Part 5, Saving and Losing an Empire. This is the fifth and final part of our series asking the question, Who Were the Romans? How did they understand themselves as a people and the idea of Roman as an identity? Was this a homogenous, ethnically defined group, as some versions of pop folk history would have it? Or was Roman always a complex identity, which encompassed a range of cultural, ethnic, linguistic, and religious groups? This week, we are, at last, going to look at the end of the empire. In the first four parts of this series, we established that by any reasonable measure, the Roman world ought to have been considered diverse. From its very beginnings as a frontier town sitting at the crossroads of several different cultural zones in Italy, through Rome's experience incorporating the culturally and linguistically diverse peoples of pre-Roman Italy into its army and later into its citizen body, to the Roman Empire of the 3rd and 4th centuries AD, which encompassed a bewildering array of peoples from all over the Mediterranean basin. The Romans didn't merely conquer and subjugate a wide variety of peoples. Though they did that, they also steadily incorporated those people in a process that was mostly motivated by expediency and the desire to wring the maximum amount of military power out of Rome's conquests, but which had the side effect of minting new Romans out of conquered peoples. Consequently, by the end of the first century BC, the populus Romanus had come to include the many different peoples of pre-Roman Italy and Cisalpine Gaul. Over the decades that followed, Roman identity, rooted in the legal status of citizenship, but often having also linguistic and cultural expressions, would filter through the elite all over the Roman Empire, slowly expanding downward, until in 212, the Constitutio Antoniniana extended citizenship to all free people in the Roman Empire. People that joined the Populus Romanus this way didn't give up their other identities. As we've seen, their identities tended to layer, with the Roman toga added on top. Though as we've also seen, that Roman identity, once obtained, tended to be a very important identity. By this point, I should hope that the Hollywood vision of Rome as a culturally homogenous society, at any point in its history, speaking the Queen's Latin, has been well and truly vanquished. Yet that vision of Rome ends up being used to support a particular vision of the causes for Rome's rise and fall, which, having now established the nature of our evidence for diversity in Rome, it is time to approach. The argument, a form of it notably made in 2015 by Niall Ferguson, conspicuously, not a Roman historian, I might note, goes thusly, that Rome was once homogenous, that the superior power of a homogenous society allowed Rome to expand, that expansion made Rome diverse, and that this weakened Rome such that it fell. Often, it appears in the more simplistic form, that Rome fell because they let the barbarians in, with lots of attendant political implications for current policy. Now, we already know at the outset that the first half of this argument, the assumption that Rome was initially homogenous and able to expand because of that, is fatally flawed, because Rome was never homogenous in that way. But what about the second half of that argument? Did letting all of these folks from Spain, Gaul, Britain, North Africa, the Levant, Greece, the Balkans, and so on, did that somehow dilute the special alchemy that made the Romans successful. But first, as always, if you like what you are reading here, please share it. If you really like it, you can support me on Patreon. And if you want updates whenever a new post appears, you can click below for email updates or follow me on Twitter, at Brett Devereaux, for updates as to new posts, as well as my occasional ancient history, foreign policy, or military history musings. The Gravity of the Situation I want to start with the observation I offer whenever I am asked 
and being a Romanist, this happens frequently, why did Rome fall? Which is to note that in asking that question, we are essentially asking the wrong question, or at least a less interesting one. This will, I promise, come back to our core question about diversity and the fall of Rome, but first we need to frame this issue correctly, because Rome fell for the same reason all empires fall. Gravity. An analogy, if you will. Imagine I were to build a bridge over a stream, and for 20 years, the bridge stays up, and then one day, quite unexpectedly, the bridge collapses. We can ask why the bridge fell down, but the fundamental force of gravity, which caused its collapse, was always working on the bridge. As we all know from our physics classes, the force of gravity was always active on the bridge, and so some other set of forces, channeled through structural elements, was needed to be continually resisting that downward pressure. What we really want to know is what force which was keeping the bridge up in such an unnaturally elevated position stopped. Perhaps some key support rotted away. Perhaps rain and weather shifted the ground so that what once was a stable position 20 years ago was no longer stable. Or perhaps the steady work of gravity itself slowly strained the materials, imperceptibly at first, until material fatigue finally collapsed to the bridge. Whatever the cause, we need to begin by conceding that, as normal as they may seem to us, bridges are not, generally, some natural construction, but rather a deeply unnatural one which must be held up and maintained through continual effort. Such a thing may fail even if no one actively destroys it, merely by lack of maintenance or changing conditions. Large, prosperous, and successful states are always and everywhere like that bridge. They are unnatural social organizations, elevated above the misery and fragmentation that is the natural state of humankind, only by great effort. Gravity ever tugs them downward. Of course, when states collapse, there are often many external factors that play a role, like external threats, climate shifts, or economic changes. Though in many cases, these are pressures that the state in question has long endured. Consequently, the more useful question is not why they fall, but why they stay up at all. And that question is even more pointed for the Roman Empire than most. While not the largest empire of antiquity, the Roman Empire was very large. Walter Scheidel figures that, as a percentage of the world's population at the time, the Roman Empire was the fifth largest ever rare company indeed. While not the longest lasting empire of antiquity, it did last an uncommonly long time at that size. It was also geographically positioned in a space that doesn't seem particularly well suited for building empires in. While the Mediterranean's vast maritime highway made the Roman Empire possible, the geography of the Mediterranean has historically encouraged quite a lot of fragmentation, particularly, but not exclusively, in Europe. Despite repeated attempts, no subsequent empire has managed to recreate Rome's frontiers. The Ottomans got the closest, effectively occupying the Roman Empire's eastern half, with a bit more besides, but missing most of the west. The Roman Empire was also, for its time, uncommonly prosperous. As we'll see, there is at this point quite a lot of evidence to suggest that the territory of the Roman Empire enjoyed a meaningfully higher standard of living and a more prosperous economy during the period of Roman control than it did either in the centuries directly before or directly after. Though we should not overstate this to the point of assuming that Rome was more prosperous than any point during the Middle Ages. And while the process of creating the Roman Empire was extremely violent and traumatic, again, a recommendation for G. Baker, spare no one. Mass violence in Roman warfare, 2021, for a sense of just how violent. Subsequent to that, the evidence strongly suggests that life in the interior Roman Empire 
was remarkably peaceful during that period, with conflicts pushed out of the interior to the frontiers. Though, I would argue this almost certainly reflects an overall decrease in the total amount of military conflict, not merely a displacement of it. The Roman Empire was thus a deeply unnatural, deeply unusual creature, a hothouse flower blooming untended on a rocky hillside. The question is not why the Roman Empire eventually failed. All states do, if one takes a long enough timeline. But why it lasted so long in such a difficult position? Of course, this isn't the place to recount all of the reasons why the Roman Empire held together for so long. But we can focus on a few which are immediately relevant to our question about diversity in the empire. Diversity in the Roman army. As we've seen, there had always been non-Romans fighting alongside Roman citizens in the army, for as long as we have reliable records to judge the point. In the Republic, until the 80s BC, these had consisted mostly of the Socii, Rome's Italian allies. These were supplemented by troops from whatever allies Rome might have at the time, but there was a key difference in that the Socii were integrated permanently into the Roman army structure, with an established place in the org chart compared to the forces of allies who might fight under their own leaders with an ad hoc relationship to the Roman army they were fighting with. The end of the Social War, 91 to 87 BC, brought the Italians into the Roman citizen body, and thus their soldiers into the legions themselves. It marked the effective end of the Socii system, which hadn't been expanded outside of Italy in any case. But almost immediately, we see the emergence of a new system for incorporating non-Romans, this time provincial non-Romans, into the Roman army. These troops, called auxilia, literally helpers, first appear in the civil wars, particularly with Caesar's heavy reliance on Gallic cavalry to support his legions, which at this time seem not to have featured their own integrated cavalry support, as they had earlier in the Republic and as they would later in the Empire. The system is, at this point, very ad hoc, and the auxiliaries here are a fairly small part of Roman armies. But when Augustus sets out to institutionalize and stabilize the Roman army after the Battle of Actium, 31 BC, and the end of the civil wars, the auxilia emerge as a permanent, institutional part of the Roman army. Clearly they were vastly expanded. By 23 AD, they made up half of the total strength of the Roman army. Tacitus, Annals, section 4, line 5. A rough equivalence that seems to persist at least as far as the Constitutio Antoniniana in 212. Of course, it was no particular new thing for the Romans to attempt to use their imperial subjects as part of their army. The Achaemenid army had incorporated a bewildering array of subject peoples with their own distinctive fighting styles, a fact that Achaemenid rulers like to commemorate, see below. The Seleucid army at Magnesia, 189, which the Romans defeated, also had numerous non-Macedonian supporting troops. Cappadocians, Galatians, Carians, Cilicians, Illyrians, Dahi, Mysians, Arabs, Kirtians, and Elamites. At Raphia, 217, the Ptolemaic army incorporated Egyptian troops into the phalanx for the first time, but also included Cretans, Greek mercenaries, Thracians, Gauls, and Libyans, inter alia. Most empires try to do this. Image. Relief from the tomb of Xerxes I. Image description. Via Wikipedia. A relief from the tomb of Xerxes I, reigned 486 to 465, at Naqshe Rustam, showing the various ethnicities of his army. End of image description. The difference here is the relative performance that Rome gets out of these subject troops, both the Socii and the Auxilia. Take those examples. Quite a number of the ethnicities on Xerxes' monument both served in the armies of Darius III fighting against Alexander, but then swiftly switched sides to Alexander after he won the battles. The Ionians, Egypt, and Babylon greeted Alexander as a liberator, at least initially, which is part of why the Achaemenid Empire could crumble so fast, so long as Alexander kept winning battles. Apart from Tyre and Gaza, the tough sieges and guerrilla resistance didn't start until he reached the Persian homeland. The auxiliaries in the Seleucid army at Magnesia 
famously fell apart under pressure, whereas the Roman socii stuck in the fight as well as the legions. Our sources give us no sense at any point that the socii were ever meaningfully weaker fighters than the legions. If anything, Livy sometimes represents them as more spirited, though he has an agenda here, as discussed. And the Ptolemaic decision to arm their Egyptian troops in the Macedonian manner won the battle. Turns out, Egyptians could fight just as well as Greeks and Macedonians with the right organization and training. But their subsequent apparent decision not to pay or respect those troops, as well as their Macedonians, seems to have led quite directly to the Great Revolt, which crippled the kingdom. There is some scholarly argument about this last point, but while I think Polybius's pro-Greek anti-Egyptian bias creeps into his analysis, he is fundamentally right to see the connection. Polybius, Book 5, Section 107. Polybius thinks it was foolish to arm non-Greeks, but the solution here to saving the Ptolemaic kingdom would have been arming the Egyptians and then incorporating them into the system of rule, rather than attempting to keep up the ethnic hierarchy with a now armed, angry, and underpaid underclass. The Greek speakers only club system of Ptolemaic rule was unsustainable in either case, especially with Rome on the horizon. By contrast, the auxilia were mostly very reliable. The one major exception comes from 69 AD, the year of the four emperors, to give some sense of its chaos. When the Batavian chief, Julius Civilis, himself an auxiliary veteran and a Roman citizen, revolted and brought one ala and eight cohorts drawn from the Batavi, probably around 4,500 men or so, with him, out of an empire-wide total of roughly 150,000 auxilia. So, maybe something like 3.3% of the total auxilia. Indeed, the legions had worse mutinies. The mutiny on the Rhine, Tacitus, Annals, section 1, line 16, FF, in 14 AD, had involved six legions, roughly 30,000 troops, nearly a full quarter of Rome's 25 legions at the time. This despite the fact that the auxilia were often deployed away from the legions, sometimes in their own forts. You'll see older works of scholarship suggest that the auxilia were kept logistically dependent on the legions, but more recent archaeology on exactly where they were has tended to push against this view. Indeed, the auxilia were often the only military forces, albeit in small detachments, in the otherwise demilitarized senatorial provinces, which comprised most of the wealthy populous core of the empire. They could be trusted with the job, provided they weren't the only forces in their own home provinces, and after 69, they never were. And the auxilia fought hard and quite well. The Romans occasionally won battles with nothing but the auxilia, as with the Battle of Mons Graupius, 83 AD, Tacitus, Agricola, 35 FF, where the legions were held in reserve and never committed, the auxilia winning the battle effectively on their own. Viewers of the column of Trajan's spiral frieze have long noted that the auxilia on the monument, the troop types are recognized by their equipment, do most of the fighting, while the legions mostly perform support and combat engineering tasks. We aren't well informed about the training the auxilia went through, but what we do know points to long-service professionals who were drilled every bit as hard as the famously well-drilled legions. Consequently, they had exactly the sort of professional cohesion that we've already discussed. Why this difference in effectiveness and reliability? The answer is to be found in the difference in the terms under which they serve. Rather than being treated as the disposable native auxiliaries of other empires, the Romans acted like the auxilia mattered, because they did. First of all, the auxilia were paid. Our evidence here is imperfect and still much argued about, but it seems that auxilia were paid five-sixths of the wages of the legionary counterparts, with the cavalry auxilia actually paid more than the infantry legionaries. While it might sound frustrating to be systematically paid one-sixth less than your legionary equivalent, the legions were paid fairly well. The auxilia probably made in wages about as much as a normal day laborer, but the wage was guaranteed something very much not the case for civilian laborers. And while the cost of their rations was deducted from their pay, that deduction was a fixed amount, 
that seems to have been set substantially below the market value of their rations, building in another subsidy. Most auxiliaries seem to have been volunteers because the deal in being an auxiliary was good enough to attract volunteers looking to serve a full tour of duty, around 20 years. This was a long-service professional army now, so joining it meant making a career out of it. And most importantly, eventually, perhaps under Tiberius or shortly thereafter, the auxilia began to receive a special grant of citizenship on finishing that tour of duty, one which covered the soldier and any children he might have had by his subsequent spouse, including children had, it seems, before he left the army. Roman soldiers in this period were legally barred from contracting legal marriages while serving, so the grant is framed so that it retroactively legitimizes any children produced in a quasi-marriage when the tour of service is completed. Consequently, whereas a soldier being dragooned or hired as a mercenary into other multi-ethnic imperial armies might end his service and go back to being an oppressed subject, the Roman auxiliary, by virtue of his service, became Roman, and thus essentially joined the ruling class, at least in ethnic status. Auxiliaries also clearly got a share of the loot when offensive warfare happened, and while there is a lot of debate as to if they also received the premia, the large retirement bonus legionaries got, epigraphically, it is pretty clear that auxiliaries who were careful with their money could establish themselves fairly well after their service. I should also note that what we see of auxiliaries suggests they were generally well-armed, with some exceptions which may have more to do with stereotyped depictions of certain kinds of barbarians than anything else. Metal helmets, male shirts, and expensive and high-quality armor for the period, oval shields, a spear, and a spatha, a Roman version of the classic Gaelic one-handed cutting sword, are the standard visual indicator in Roman artwork for generic auxiliaries. That is actually a fairly high-end kit. It is no surprise that the auxilia could win battles with it. Image. Relief, depicting Roman auxiliaries at the invasion of Dacia. Image description. Via Wikipedia, Roman auxiliaries crossing a pontoon bridge during Trajan's invasion of Dacia, as seen on Trajan's column, roughly 110, in Rome. End of image description. The attentive should already be noting many of the components of the old Socii system now in a new form. The non-Roman troops serve under similar conditions with the Romans, get similar pay and rations, Forts occupied by the auxilia show no deviation from the standard Roman military diet, a share of loot and glory, and can finally be rewarded for loyal service by being inducted into the Roman citizen body itself. Which could mean their sons might well enroll in the legions, a thing which does seem to have happened, as we do see a fair bit of evidence from military families over multiple generations. For those looking for more detail on the auxilia, a lot of this is drawn from a book I have already recommended, Ian Haynes' Blood of the Provinces, The Roman Auxilia and the Making of Provincial Society from Augustus to the Severans, 2013. Also still useful for the history of the development of the auxilia is D.B. Saddington, The Development of the Roman Auxiliary Forces from Caesar to Vespasian, 1982. This is, alas, not an easy book to find, as it is, to my knowledge, long out of print. But your library may be able to track down a copy. Helping Helpers That frankly unusual structure for a multi-ethnic imperial army brought three principal benefits for the Roman army and consequently for the Roman Empire itself. The most obvious of these is manpower. Especially with a long-service professional army, capable and qualified recruits are in limited supply. The size of the Roman army during the imperial period ranged from around 300,000 to around 500,000. But in 14 AD, the year of Augustus's death, there were only 4,937,000 Roman citizens. Res Gesti, section 8, line 11. A figure which, probably a word I'm using to gloss over one of the most technical and complex arguments in the field, includes women and children. Needless to say, keeping something close to a fifth of the adult male citizen population under arms continually, forever, was simply never going to be feasible. After his victory in 31 BC at Actium, 
Octavian, soon to be Augustus, had acted quickly to pare down the legions, disbanding some, merging others, until he reached a strength of just 28. 25 after the three legions lost in 9 AD were not replaced. It was a necessary move, as the massive armies that had been raised during the fever pitch climax of the civil wars simply could not be kept under arms indefinitely. Nor could a short-term service conscript army be expected to garrison the hundreds of miles of Roman limes, frontier, border, in perpetuity. Harnessing the manpower of the provinces was simply the necessary solution. So necessary that almost every empire does it. By their very nature, empires consist of a core which rules over a much larger subject region, typically with far greater population. Securing all of that territory almost always requires larger forces than the core's population is able or willing to provide, leading to the recruitment of auxiliaries of all kinds. But, whereas many imperial auxiliaries, as noted above, turn out to be potential dangers or weaknesses, Rome's auxilia seem to have been fairly robustly bought in on the system, allowing Rome to access motivated, loyal, cohesive, and highly effective manpower, quite literally doubling the amount of military force at their disposal, which in turn mattered a great deal because the combat role of the auxilia was significant, in stark contrast to many other imperial armies which might use auxiliaries only in subsidiary roles. The auxilia also served to supply many of the combat arms the Romans themselves weren't particularly good at. The Romans had always performed very well as heavy infantry and combat engineers, but only passably as light infantry and truly poorly as shock cavalry. They generally hadn't deployed meaningful numbers of their own missile cavalry or archers at all. We've already talked a lot about how social institutions and civilian culture can be important foundational elements for certain kinds of warfare, and this is no less true with the Romans. But by recruiting from subject peoples whose societies did value and practice the kinds of warfare the Romans were, frankly, bad at, the Roman skill set could be diversified. And early on, this is exactly what we see the auxilia being used for along with also providing supplemental heavy infantry, with sagittarii, archers, funditores, slingers, exploratores, scouts, and cavalry, light, heavy, and missile, giving the Romans access to a combined arms fighting force with considerable flexibility. And the system clearly works. Even accounting for exaggerated victories, it is clear that Roman armies stretched over so long a frontier were both routinely outnumbered but also routinely victorious anyway. Image. Relief of Auxiliary Archers from the Column of Trajan. Image Description. Via Wikipedia, another panel from the Column of Trajan in Rome, you can see auxiliary archers in the top left, wearing scale armor. In the bottom center, you can see the legionaries with their distinctive squared-off shields, the scutum, and their segmented armor, today called the lorica segmentata, though this is not an ancient term. To their right, you can see more auxiliaries, wearing what may be male under a textile cover and using oval shields. They are fighting Dacians, who occupy the right half of the panel. End of image description. As Ian Haynes notes, the ethnic distinctiveness of various auxilia units does not seem to have lasted forever, though in some cases distinctive dress, equipment, and fighting styles lasted longer. Most auxilia were posted far from their regions of origin, and their units couldn't rely on access to recruits from their homeland to sustain their numbers over the long haul. Although, some number of recruits would almost certainly come from the military families of veterans settled near the forts. But that didn't mean the loss of the expertise and distinctive fighting styles of the auxilia. Rather, skills, weapons, and systems which worked tended to get diffused through the Roman army particularly in the auxilia, but it is hard not to notice that eventually the spatha replaces the gladius as the sword of the legions. As Ovid quips, Fas est et ab osta docari, quote, it is right to learn, even from the enemy, end quote. Metamorphosis, Book 4, Line 428. The Romans do that a lot. The long-service professional nature of these units presumably made a lot of this possible, with individual cohortes and allies 
becoming their own pockets of living tradition in the practice of various kinds of fighting and acclimating new recruits to it. Consequently, not only did the Roman army get access to these fighting styles, because the auxilia were actually integrated into the military system rather than merely attached to it, they also got the opportunity to adopt or imitate the elements of the fighting styles that work. Finally, the auxilia system also minted new Romans. We've already mentioned that auxilia veterans received Roman citizenship on retirement, but that wasn't the extent of it. We can see in inscriptions that the degree of cultural fluency that soldiers in the auxilia gained with Roman culture was high. They often adopted Roman or Romanized names and seemed to have basically always learned Latin, presumably because their Roman officers wouldn't have spoken their language. While some units of the auxilia kept distinctive national dress as a sort of uniform, most of the auxilia seemed to have adopted a style of dress that, while distinct from the legions, was generally in keeping with the Roman tradition of military dress, which was not quite the same as Roman civilian dress. They also partook of the Roman military diet. Roman soldiers kept a similar diet all over the empire, even if that meant shipping thousands of amphora of olive oil and sour wine to northern England, which would have given them a diet in common with many workaday Romans, too. Once retired, auxilia soldiers tended to settle where they served, rather than returning to their home provinces, which meant settling in frontier provinces where their citizenship set them apart as distinctively Roman, wherever they may have come from. Image, Roman Military Diploma Image Description From the British Museum, a Roman military diploma, Inventory, 1930, 0419.1 the official document granting citizenship to an auxiliary, here a fellow named Gemellus, at the end of his tour of service. This one is dated July 17, 122 AD, and was found in Brigettia, modern Zonyi, Hungary. You can imagine a proud auxiliary veteran posting this on the wall of his house for everyone to see. To have been produced in bronze, as this one is, mark the value of it. End of image description. Exactly how many auxilia would have retired like this requires a degree of number crunching. Given a 20-year tour of service and zero mortality, we might expect around 7,500 men to pass through the auxilia each year. But of course, mortality wasn't zero. And so we have to expect that of our roughly 20-year-old recruits, some number are going to die before retirement. Using some model life tables, following B. Fryer, demography, in CAH squared, 11, 2000, we should figure that very roughly one-third of our recruits will have died before reaching discharge. We then need to adjust our recruitment figures to retain the same total strength and we get something like 9,000 new recruits each year to keep a strength of roughly 150,000 with mortality counted for and 20-year tours. That gives us roughly 6,000 auxilia living to retirement each year. That may seem a small number, but that graduate accretion matters when it runs for decades and centuries, and the newly enfranchised family units. Recall that the citizenship grant covers children and sort of kind of his spouse, tend to settle on the frontiers, which is a really handy place to have communities of citizens. If we assume that these new citizen families mostly reproduce themselves, or more correctly, that they went extinct or split with multiple children at roughly the same rate with no natural population growth. Then, we'd expect this process to produce perhaps something like 1.5 million new citizen households up until the Constitutio Antoniniana. Being very back of the envelope then, we might, once we account for women and children descendants of those soldiers, assume that on the eve of the general grant of citizenship in 212, there were perhaps 4 million Romans whose citizenship status was a product of service in the auxilia somewhere in their history, perhaps representing something like 7% of the entire population, including non-free persons. Were we to assume larger households, which seems wise given that retired auxiliaries are probably more likely than average to be in an economic position to have a larger family, that figure would be even higher. Note on the coverage of the spouse. The grant of citizenship covered any biological children of the discharged auxiliary, but did not extend citizenship to his wife. It did 
However, give an auxiliary the right to contract a lawful marriage with effectively any free woman, including non-citizens, and the children resulting from such a union would be citizens themselves. Consequently, it extended one of the core privileges of citizenship to the non-citizen wife of a discharged auxiliary, the right to bear citizen children, since the wife would be part of the retired auxiliary's household, and then later, if he predeceased her, potentially in the household of her male citizen children, she'd be legally covered in many cases because a legal action against her would generally be an action against her husband or child. Given that a number of the rights of citizens simply didn't apply to women in the Roman world, for example, office holding, this system left the wife of a retired auxiliary with many, but not all, of the privileges of citizenship, so long as her husband and her marriage survived. That said, the legal status remained vested in her husband or her children, which made it more than a little precarious. One of these days, we can talk more about the structure of the Roman familia. That is a very meaningful number of new Romans, and those figures don't account for some of the other ways Roman citizenship tended to expand through communities, both through manumission but also the political networks citizenship created. Your Latin-speaking former auxiliary citizen neighbors are a lot more likely to be able to help intercede to get you citizenship or get your community recognized as a municipia with that attendant citizenship grant. But not only are those New Romans by legal status, but New Romans who have, by dint of military training and discipline, absorbed quite a lot of Roman culture. As best as we can tell, they tended to view the Roman Empire as their polity, rather than as a foreign or oppressive entity. They were bought in, as it were. Again, this does not seem to have been the Roman intent, but rather an opportunistic, self-serving response to the need to maintain the loyalty of these troops. Citizenship was, after all, a free benefit the emperor might bestow at no cost to the treasury, since citizens who lived outside of Italy still owed taxes, or himself. Of course, that fits the auxilia into a later pattern in the provinces which becomes perhaps most apparent as the Roman Empire begins to collapse. Kicking, gouging, and screaming. The fall of the Roman Empire in the West, please, right now, just mentally add the phrase in the West next to every the fall of Rome, and similar phrases here and elsewhere, is complicated. I don't mean it is complicated in its causes or effects, though it is that too. I mean it is complicated in its raw events, the who, what, where, and when of it. Most students are taught a fairly simple version of this, because most of what they need to actually learn is the cause and the effects, and so the actual fall part is a sort of black box where Huns, Vandals, Goths, plague, climate, and economic decline go in, and political fragmentation, more economic decline, and the European Middle Ages come out. The fall itself ends up feeling like an event rather than a process, because it is compressed down to a single point, the black box, where all of the causes become all of the effects. That is, frankly, a defensible way to teach the topic at a survey level, where it might get, at most, a lecture or two, either at the end of a Roman history survey or the beginning of a medieval history survey. And it is honestly more or less how I teach it. But if you want to actually try to say something intelligent about the whole thing, you need to grapple with what actually happened, rather than the classroom black box model designed for teaching efficiency rather than detail. We are not going to do that today, though I will have some bibliography here for those who want to. The key thing here is that the fall of Rome in the West is not an event but a century-long process from 376 to 476. Roman power in the West contracts for a lot of that, but it expands in periods as well, particularly under the leadership of Aetius, 433 to 454, and Majorian, 457 to 461. 
there are points where it would have really looked like the Romans might actually be able to recover. Even in 476, it was not obvious to anyone that Roman rule had actually ended. Odoacer, who had just deposed what was to be the last Roman emperor in the West, promptly offered the crown to Zeno, the Roman emperor in the East. There is argument about his sincerity, but James O'Donnell argues, very well, though I disagree on some key points, that this represented a real opportunity for Rome to rise from defeat in a new form, yet again. Image. Map of the Fragmentation of the Western Roman Empire. Image Description. Via Wikipedia. A map of the fragmentation of the Western Roman Empire, but also noting Majorian's considerable reconquests. One wonders, had he not been killed by Ricimer in 461, what he might have achieved. End of Image Description. Glancing even further back, historically, this wasn't even the first time the Roman Empire had been on the brink of collapse. Beginning in 238, the Roman Empire had suffered a long series of crippling civil wars and secession crises collectively known as the Crisis of the 3rd Century, 238 to 284. At one point, the empire was de facto split into three, with one emperor in Britain and Gaul, another in Italy, and the client kingdom of Palmyra, essentially running the eastern half of the empire under their queen, Zenobia. Empires do not usually survive those kinds of catastrophes, but the Roman Empire survived the crisis, recovered all of its territory, save Decia, and even enjoyed a period of relative peace afterwards, before trouble started up again. The reason that empires do not generally survive those kinds of catastrophes is that generally, when empires weaken, they find that they contain all sorts of people who have been waiting, sometimes patiently, sometimes less so, for any opportunity to break away. The rather sudden collapse of the Neo-Assyrian Empire, 911 to 609 BC, is a good case study. After having conquered much of the Near East, the Assyrians fell into a series of succession wars beginning in 627. Their Mesopotamian subjects smelled blood and revolted in 625. That was almost under control by 620, but the Medes and Persians, external vassals of the Assyrians, smelled blood too and invaded allying with the rebelling Babylonians in 616. Assyria was effectively gone by 612 with the loss and destruction of Nineveh. They had gone from the largest empire in the world at that time or at any point prior to non-existence in 15 years. While the Assyrian collapse is remarkable for its speed and finality, the overall process is much the same in most cases. Once imperial power begins to wane, revolt, suddenly looks more possible, and so the downward slope of a collapse can be very steep indeed. One might equally use the case study of decolonization after World War II as an example. Each newly independent country increased the pressure on all of the rest. Yet, there is no great rush to the doors for Rome. Instead, as Guy Halsall puts it in Barbarian Migrations and the Roman West, 2007, quote, the West did not drift hopelessly towards its inevitable fate. It went down, kicking, gouging, and screaming. End quote. Among the kicked and gouged, of course, were Attila and his Huns. Fought to a draw at the Battle of the Catalonian Plains, his empire disintegrated after his death two years later, under pressure from both Germanic tribes and the Eastern Roman Empire, and the standard tendency for steppe empires to fragment. Of his three sons, Elak was killed by revolting Germanic peoples who had been subject to the Huns. Dengizich, by the Eastern Romans, were told his head was put on display in Constantinople. And the last, Irnak, just disappears in our narrative after the death of Dengizich. The Romans, it turns out, did eventually get down to business to defeat the Huns. But the Romans doing all of that kicking, gouging, and screaming were not the handful of old families from the early days of the Republic. Most of those hard-fighting Romans were people who, in 14 AD, would have been provincials. And indeed, the Roman Empire would survive in the East where Rome wasn't, making for a Roman Empire that by 476 consisted effectively entirely of provincial 
Romans. Instead, what we see are essentially three sets of actions by provincial elites who in any other empire would have been leading the charge for the exits. There were the kickers, gougers, and screamers, as Halsall notes. There were also, as Ralph Matheson, Roman aristocrats in Barbarian Gaul, 1993, has noted, elites who, seeing the writing on the wall, made no effort to hasten the collapse of the empire, but instead retreated into their estates, their books, and their letters. These fellows often end up married into and advising the new barbarian kings who set up in the old Roman provinces, which in turn contributes quite a bit to the preservation and continued influence of Roman law and culture in the various fragmented successor states of the early Middle Ages. Finally, there were elites so confident that the empire would survive, because it always had, that they mostly focused on improving their position within the empire, even at the cost of weakening it, not because they wanted out, but because out was inconceivable to them. Both Halsall and also James O'Donnell, The Ruin of the Roman Empire, 2009, document many of these. If I may continue my analogy, when the exit door was yawning wide open, almost no one walked through. Some tried to put out the burning building they were in, Others were content to be at the center of the ruins, but no one actually left. During the crisis of the third century, that set of responses had been crucial for the empire's survival, and for brief moments in the 400s, it looked like they might even have saved it again. For all of the things that brought the Roman Empire down, it is striking that internal revolts of long-ruled peoples weren't one of them. And that speaks to the power of Rome's effective, if, again, largely unintentional, management of diversity. The Roman willingness to incorporate conquered peoples into the core citizen body and into Romanness meant that even by 238, to the extent that the residents of the empire could even imagine its collapse, they saw that potentiality as a disaster rather than as a liberation. That gave the empire tremendous resilience in the face of disaster, such that it took a century of unremitting bad luck to bring it down, and even then, it only managed to take down half of it. As an aside, those provincial Romans were correct in the judgment that the collapse of the empire would mean disaster. The running argument about the fall of the Roman Empire is generally between the decline and fall perspective, which presents the collapse of the Roman Empire as a bad thing, and the change and continuity perspective, which both stresses continuity after the collapse, but also tends to try to minimize the negative impacts of it, even to the point of suggesting that the average Roman peasant might have been better off in the absence of heavy Roman taxes. That latter view is particularly common among many medievalists who are understandably quite tired of the unfairly poor reputation their period gets. This is an argument that for some time lived in the airy space of narrative and perspective where both sides could put an argument out. Unfortunately for some of the change in continuity arguments about living standards, archaeology has a tendency to give us data that is somewhat less malleable. That archaeological data shows, with a high degree of consistency, that while there is certainly some continuity between the late antique and the early Middle Ages, the fall of Rome in the West killed lots of people. Precipitous declines in population in societies without reliable birth control, probably this is mostly food scarcity, not direct warfare, and that living standards also declined to a degree that the results are archaeologically visible. As Brian Ward Perkins notes in The Fall of Rome and the End of Civilization, 2005, the collapse causes cows to shrink, speaking to sudden scarcity of winter fodder, which in turn likely speaks to a general reduction in available nutrition. Some areas were worse hit than others. Robin Fleming, Britain After Rome, 2010, notes, for instance, that in post-Roman Britain, pot-making technology was lost because ceramic production had been focused in cities, which had been largely depopulated out of existence. The fall of Rome might have been good for some people, but the evidence is, I think, at this point, inescapable that it was quite bad 
for most people, especially, one assumes, all of the people who got depopulated. Image. Map of the Roman world in 476. Image description. Via Wikipedia, the Roman world, after the deposition of Romulus Augustulus in 476. Fragmentation in the west, though Rome survives in the east. Again, Speaking to the complexity of the collapse, each of those successor barbarian kingdoms has their own complicated story about how they ended up with that particular chunk of the empire. End of image description. Fodorati failures. But if the Roman Empire, in the West, went down fighting, why did it collapse? Of course, there is no simple answer to that question. The mass migrations of the 4th and 5th century clearly played a very large role, but then the Romans had defeated other such migrations, recall the Cimbri and the Teutones, before. There are strong indicators that other factors, unrelated to our current topic, were also at play. The empire had been economically weakened by the crisis of the 3rd century, which may have disrupted a lot of the trade and state functions that created the revenue to fund state activity. At the same time, the crisis and the more challenging security situation after it meant that Roman armies grew larger and with them the burden of paying and feeding the soldiers, which further hurt the economy. Meanwhile, long exposure to Roman armies on the frontiers of the empire had begun to erode the initially quite vast qualitative advantage the Romans enjoyed. The gap between Roman and barbarian military capabilities began to shrink although it never really vanished altogether in this period. But some of the causes do bear on our topic, but in quite the other direction from what the Neal Fergusons of the world might assume. Let's start with the Fodorati. After the Constitutio Antoniniana, there was no longer much need for the auxilia, as all persons in the empire were citizens. And so, the structured distinction between the legions and other formations fades away. Part of this is also the tendency of the legions in this period to be progressively split up into smaller units called vexillationes, meaning that the unit sizes wouldn't have been so different. But during the 4th century, with frontier pressures building, the Romans again looked for ways to utilize the manpower and fighting skill of non-Romans. What is striking here is that whereas in some ways, discussed above, the auxilia had represented almost a revival of the attitudes which had informed the system for the socii. The new system that emerged for using foreign troops, called foderati, treaty men, did not draw on the previously successful auxilia system, which to be clear by this point had been effectively gone for more than a century. Instead, the Romans signed treaties with Germanic-speaking kings, exchanging chunks of, often, depopulated, war-torn frontier, land, in exchange for military service. Since these troops were bound by treaty, fodus, they were called foderati. They served in their own units, under their own leaders, up to their own kings. Consequently, all of the mechanisms that encouraged the auxilia to adopt Roman practices and identify with the Roman Empire were lost. These men might view Rome as a friendly ally at times, but they were never encouraged to think of themselves as Roman. The reason for this different system of recruitment seems to be rooted in financial realities. The Roman army had already been expanded during the crisis of the 3rd century and only grew more under Diocletian and Constantine. Probably by this point being between 400,000 and 500,000 men, compared to 300,000 to 350,000 earlier in the empire. Moreover, Diocletian had opted to reform the empire's administration with a much more intensive, top-down, bureaucratic approach, which imposed further costs. Taxes had become heavy, although elites were increasingly allowed to dodge them. The economy was weak, and revenues were short. The value of the Fodorati was that the empire didn't have to pay them. They were handed land, again in war-torn frontier zones, and expected to use that to pay for their military support. At the time, it must have seemed a brilliant workaround to get more military power out of a dwindling tax base. Image. Statues of the Tetrarchs. 
Image Description Via Wikipedia The porphyry statues of the Tetrarchs, the four emperors under Diocletian, now in Venice. While the artist is drawing attention to their notional unity, thus all of the hugging, it is also notable how much the third century had changed the job of emperors. During the first two centuries, Roman emperors were more often depicted in their civilian dress than as soldiers, but here, the martial imagery, including the hands gripping tight the hilts of swords, is strongly pronounced. The emperor was, by this point, a soldier first and a civilian administrator second. End of image description. I feel the need to note that I increasingly regard Diocletian, reign 284 to 305, as a ruinous emperor. Even though he lacked the normal moralizing character flaws of bad emperors, while he was active, dedicated, and focused, almost all of his reforms turned out to be quite bad ideas in the long run, even before one gets to the Great Persecution. His currency reforms were catastrophic, his administrative reforms were top-heavy, his tax plan depended on a regular census which was never regular, and the Tetrarchy was doomed from its inception. Diocletian was pretty much a living, well, you tried, meme. That said, to be clear, Diocletian wasn't responsible for the Fodorati. It's not quite clear who the first Fodorati were. They may have been the Franks in 358, which would make Julian, as a Caesar or junior emperor under Constantius, the culprit for this bad idea. He had a surplus of those too. The problem, of course, is right there. The status of the Fodorati made it impossible for them to ever fully integrate into the empire. They had, after all, their own kings, their own local laws, and served in their own military formations. While, interestingly, they would eventually adopt Latin from the local population which had already done so, leading to French, Spanish, and Italian, they could never become Roman. That wasn't always their choice either. As O'Donnell, original citation notes, many of these Fodorati wanted to be in the Roman Empire. It was more frequently the Romans who were busy saying no. It is striking that this occurs in a period where social class in the Roman world was generally calcifying. Whereas citizenship had been an expanding category, after the Constitutio Antoniniana, the legal categories of honestiores and humiliores, literally respectable and humble people, but in practice wealthy and commoners, largely replaced citizenship as the legal dividing lines of Roman society. These were far less flexible categories, as economic social mobility in the ancient world was never very high. Even there, the tax reforms of Diocletian, with some patches under Constantine, began, for tax purposes, to tie tenant farmers, coloni, to their land, essentially barring both physical and economic mobility in the name of more efficient tax collection in a system that strongly resembled later medieval serfdom. Nevertheless, the consequence of this system of organization was that as often as the Fodorati provided crucial soldiers to Roman armies, they were just as frequently the problem Roman armies were being sent to address. Never fully incorporated into the Roman army and under the command of their own kings, they proved deeply unreliable allies. Pitting one set of Fodorati against the next could work in the short term, but in the long term, without any plan to permanently incorporate the Fodorati into Roman society, fragmentation was inevitable. The Roman abandonment of the successful older systems for managing diverse armies, on account that they were too expensive, turned the Fodorati from a potential source of vital manpower into the central cause of imperial collapse in the West. Losing the habit. This trend towards calcification had been matched by the loss of Rome's, admittedly opportunistic and unevenly applied, religious tolerance. This is often attributed to Christianity itself, but is perhaps better understood in light of the increasing demands of emperors during and after the crisis of the third century to insist on unity through uniformity. The first empire-wide systemic persecution of Christians, the Decian Persecution, 250 AD, was exactly this, an effort to have all Romans everywhere 
sacrifice for the safety of the emperor as an act of unity, to strengthen his reign, which rather backfired because it seems not to have occurred to Decius that Christians, of whom by 250 there were many, would be unable to participate. Diocletian likewise launched the Great Persecution in 303 as part of a program to stress unity in worship and try to bind the fractured Roman Empire together, particularly by emphasizing the cults of Jupiter and Hercules. From that perspective, Christians were a threat to the enforced homogeneous unity Diocletian wanted to foster and thus had to be brought back or removed. Though, of course, in the event, Christianity's roots were by 303 far too deep for it to be uprooted. This is part of the context where we should understand Constantine, reigned 306 to 337. Constantine is famous for declaring the toleration of Christianity in the empire and being the first emperor to convert to Christianity, only on his deathbed. What is less well known is that, having selected Christianity as his favored religion, Constantine, seeking unity again, promptly set out to unify his new favored religion, by force, if necessary. A schism had arose as a consequence of Diocletian's persecution, and, now that Christianity was in the good graces of the emperor, both sides sought Constantine's aid in suppressing the other in what became known as the Donatism Controversy, as the side, which was eventually branded heretical, supported a Christian bishop named Donatus. Constantine, after failing to get the two groups to agree, settled on persecuting one of them, the Donatus, out of existence. Which didn't work, either. It is in that context that later Christian emperors' efforts to unify the empire behind Christianity, leading to the Edict of Thessalonica in 380, ought to be understood as the culmination of, by that point, more than a century of on-again, off-again efforts by emperors to try to strengthen the empire by enforcing religious unity. By the end of the 4th century, the Christian empire was persecuting pagans and Jews, not even a full century after it had been persecuting Christians. These efforts to violently enforce unity through homogeneity had the exact opposite effect. Efforts to persecute Arian Christians, who rejected the Nicene Creed, created further divisions in the empire. They also made it even more difficult to incorporate the newly arriving Germanic peoples, who had mostly converted to the wrong Arian Christianity. Meanwhile, in the 5th century, the church in the east splintered further, leading to the Nestorian, the term is contested, churches of Syria and the Coptic church in Egypt, on the outs with the official Eastern Roman church, and thus also facing persecution after the Council of Ephesus in 431. The resentment created by the policy of persecution in the East seems to have played a fairly significant role in limiting the amount of local popular resistance faced by the Muslim armies of the Rashidun Caliphate during the conquests of Syria, the Levant, and Egypt in the 630s, since in many cases, Christian communities viewed as heretical by Constantinople could actually expect potentially better treatment under Muslim rule. Needless to say, this both made the Muslim conquests of those regions easier, but also goes some distance to explaining why Roman Byzantine reconquest was such a non-starter. Efforts to enforce unity in the empire had, perhaps paradoxically, made it more fragile rather than more resilient. Conclusions Reaching back to our initial question, we now have some answers. While the Romans are often presented in popular culture as a homogenous society consisting of white northern Europeans who uniformly speak their Latin with a decidedly British accent, the truth is both more complex and more interesting. At every stage of their development, the Romans were a diverse bunch. Initially, this reflected Rome's origins as a frontier town, positioned at the meeting point of several different cultural, linguistic, and religious groups. The Romans themselves understood their own deep past to have been diverse, with Rome drawn together out of peoples from all over Italy. And while their founding myths aren't particularly accurate, on this point, the archaeology backs up the fundamental truth 
that earliest Rome was a fusion society. That diversity only grew as Rome expanded, first incorporating the different peoples of Italy, and then the different peoples of the Mediterranean more broadly. Contrary to the popular image, Rome was a diverse society by any definition, from the foundation of the Republic, if not earlier, to the collapse of the empire in the West. This was true when it came to language, culture, and religion. It was also true when it came to skin color, although this tended to be quite a bit less important to the Romans than it is to many people today. While popular media tends to portray the Romans as uniformly white, typically using British actors, the actual Romans stretch close to the full range of human skin colors. There was no particular arrangement of skin color, hair color, or type, no particular phenotype, which was distinctively Roman. There were fair-skinned Romans, dark-skinned Romans, and Romans at every point in between. That diversity of appearance was true within Roman Italy, but became radically more true in Rome's Mediterranean-spanning empire. Instead, Roman identity was marked by a legal status, citizenship, which defined belonging in the group. Visually, Roman citizenship was conveyed by clothing, the toga in particular, rather than skin, hair, facial structure, etc. The Queen's Latin vision of a Rome homogeneously white is wrong in all respects. Consequently, the theory of empire that is often built up on that cracked foundation, which supposes that the strength of a homogeneous Roman society forged their empire, and that the diversity of that empire doomed it, is fundamentally flawed, based on an amateurish and catastrophically mistaken understanding of Roman history. Rome was never homogeneous, and so there is no pristine, unmixed Roman society to hearken back to. Again, the Romans themselves knew this and declared it openly. Instead, it was Rome's opportunistic but well-honed ability to effectively manage diverse populations which led to their success. Doubtless their skill had at least some of its origins in the fact that Roman political leaders did not come from a monoculture. The relatively hands-off strategy, with a strong emphasis on local self-government, Rome had to take to deal with the diversity of Italy, provided an effective training ground for managing a vast empire. The Romans do not seem to have ever intended to forge a vast, multicultural polity out of their imperial conquests. They were, for the most part, in it for the loot, taxes, and military glory. But that Italian toolkit and the habits of politics in Rome's diverse republic were things every Roman aristocrat brought with them when they went abroad as a general or a governor. Coincidentally, the same job in the Republic and in the Empire, but that's a story for another day. Indeed, diversity was the root of Roman success. What made the Roman Empire possible, both to create and to hold, was the willingness of the Romans to opportunistically include conquered peoples in the Roman project. In the end, though, when Rome's conquest ceased, and with the frontiers defended against migrations of fresh peoples into the empire, the Romans clearly got out of the habits that had won them the empire. Emperors more strongly emphasized unity through conformity, particularly in religion, and when the Romans once again had need of non-Romans in their armies, they made the crucial mistake of keeping them separate rather than incorporating them as they had before. Diversity did not destroy the Roman Empire, but intolerance of diversity contributed greatly to its fall. Of course, part of the reason we are discussing all of this is that these examples, often in their deeply flawed Queen's Latin form, are mobilized as support for political ends. I am not a policy expert, so I am not going to suggest what particular policy these conclusions lend themselves to. But I am a Roman history expert, and so when policymakers are thinking about the examples of history to try to craft effective policies, they should consider the actual Romans 
rather than the image of Rome crafted by the BBC and Hollywood. Those Romans were not neatly homogenous. They did not neatly map onto modern racial categories. But nor were they enlightened multiculturalists. They were frequently shrewd and self-interested empire builders who recognized that it actually is true that diversity is strength. That Rome, the real Rome, the one that exists in our literary sources in the archaeological record in Roman artwork and in my classroom, the real Rome was always diverse. That's why they won. This has been a recording from a collection of unmitigated pedantry, the blog of history professor Brett Devereux, recorded by myself, a great divorce for accessibility and sharing purposes. If you enjoyed this content and wish to engage with it or support Brett, please check the description for links to the original post on his blog, his Twitter, and his Patreon. I highly encourage you to share, support, and engage with his works on any and all platforms if you are so inclined. If you wish to support me, please do remember to like, share, and subscribe to this or any other content here that you enjoy. Thank you so much for listening.